Electricast. You know, there are risks, there's exhaustion, there's weekend after weekend. I get that. I was there. And in fact, when I sold the company to my employees, we can talk about that in a minute. When I sold it to the company, I was well compensated, but I wasn't $10 million bonus on the backs of taxpayers and, and my coworkers. You know, that's just not okay. So where does that come from? It comes from the top. Welcome to Think Business with Tyler, sharing our methods and strategies for success. Join in on our conversations with business owners as we highlight their triumphs and detail how they overcame the challenges they faced while continuing to grow and scale their business. It's time to think life, think success, and think business with your host, Tyler Martin. Hello there. Welcome back. In our latest episode, we're diving into the inspiring journey of Jonathan Orpin, a trailblazer in open book management and CEO of New Energy Works and Pioneer Millworks. In this episode, you'll discover how Jonathan's radical financial transparency transformed his company culture, the intricacies of implementing an employee stock ownership plan, and why he believes prioritizing the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit, is the key to business success. Plus, you'll hear his unique perspective on overcoming the fear and greed that often derail businesses from achieving true social and environmental impact. Stay tuned. This is an episode you don't want to miss. Hey, Jonathan, welcome to the Think Business with Tyler podcast show. How are you doing? Good, thanks. How about you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Hey, I'd love to first learn a little bit about you. What do you do professionally? So I'm the CEO and founder of New Energy Works and Pioneer Millworks. Uh, we're basically a 160-person employee-owned company uh, that does high-performance building, timber framing, timber work, and we make products like flooring and paneling out of reclaimed and sustainably harvested wood. Very cool. And then a little bit about you personally. Can you share something? Sure. You know, about 15 years ago, I moved out to Portland, Oregon from our source in, uh, from our original uh, headquarters in New York State and started the same thing out here. So we're bi-coastal now. And I did that just because I needed a change personally. And uh, I like to say a view from a different mountain, not necessarily a better one. And so it allowed me to restart and, and make, make all the same mistakes again. But personally, I'm a motorcycle, I'm off-road motorcyclist, a father of two, 38-year-old and a 23-year-old. So quite a gap between the two. And uh, my son teaches me how to motorcycle and life is good. Yeah, you've got, you just mentioned prior to the show starting that you've got a, a nice two-week trip coming up that sounds like it'll even take you through the snow. Yeah, up in Mongolia. My son and I are riding across Mongolia this summer, and uh, that should be interesting. We did Namibia and South Africa last year. So, you know, this year will be, uh, again, another adventure, which is a great blessing to be able to do that with uh, my own uh, son, who, as I like to say, is a better rider than I and a better mechanic. So it's nice to have him along. Does cash flow have you down? Profit, not where you think it should be? Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you. And thanks for listening to the show. As I like to say, is a better writer than I and a better mechanic, so it's nice to have him along. <laughs> It sounds sounds like really cool to be bonding with them doing that. That's awesome. Hey, so I want to talk about you focused around being eco-friendly. And it's interesting when I hear your types of businesses, I generally don't think of being able to be eco-friendly or at least, you know, my very novice feeling about it. Can we talk about like what caused you to go in the eco-friendly direction in particular for, with your own businesses? Sure. New Energy Works, as you can imagine, is uh, started from that very thought process. I mean, I was young during the, uh, the early resurgence in the ecologically thoughtful building. It was a result of the oil embargo of the late 70s. And um, when we suddenly realized, wow, we really have a limited resource in petroleum and we might want to do something about it. And so for me, starting New Energy Works was my social innovation, I guess. You know, and as a and as an entrepreneur, unabashed entrepreneur, it just seemed like nice to be able to mix my beliefs and my day-to-day business uh, 
acumen and uh, goals together. So we are what we call a triple bottom line company. You and I talked about it a little yeah. ahead of time. It's the even uh, filters of, of the planet, the people, and profit. All important equal filters when we make decisions in our business. The thinking is that with people, we care about our coworkers, our clients, the people in our neighborhood, our church, our school, and in fact, the town and the country and the planet. And so the planet then is equally as important because last I looked, it's the only one we've got. I can't stress that enough. We're finally getting people to admit that it's not a Chinese hoax or something like that. Climate change is real. We ought to be looking at it for our kids and our grandkids. And then finally, profit. Without profit, we can't be a viable business. We can't reward our good, hardworking coworkers. We can't move forward. We can't invest in ourselves. So people, planet, and profit, you know, we, we've been that way since the very beginning. And interestingly, the triple bottom line moniker was uh, coined in the mid-90s by an environmental, uh, uh, sorry, an economist whose name I can't remember, but you can look it up on the internet. And uh, it really nailed it for me. It really just became clear as to, oh, that's what we are. So, and then from a business standpoint, I mean, to be really blunt, it's a really not a bad business strategy because every study shows people want to work with and will do more hard work for you, with you, in conjunction with you, if your values are aligned. And people want to work where they believe in. And so for me, I've always shared, you know, this triple bottom line philosophy with people and the people who are most aligned with it have stayed a long time and, and, and appreciate where they work. What does that look like in terms of like day to day where you're managing, you know, you're thinking about profit, but then also people on the planet are equally important. How does that affect your decision making? Like, do you have any like real examples where yeah, you have it can to- be a Dickens, honestly, <laughs> really? Um, you know, for instance, one of the things we're struggling with internally right now is do all of our timbers from our for our timber framing come from Forest Stewardship Council certified FSC certified forest or not? And if not, why not? It adds 15 percent or so to the cost of the timbers. Not every client wants to pay that or some can't afford that extra 15 percent. It does add up, you know, and, and by not doing that, are we not walking our talk? And so that's a big internal discussion right now and none that have been solved, you know, uh, probably right now about 50% of our wood comes from forest stewardship certified forests. Some days I'd like it to be a hundred percent, some days 75%. We do the best we can. Sure. You know, similarly with our larch for our pre-finished uh, outdoor siding um, that comes from a PEFC uh, certification. It's sort of like FSC um, and that actually took a while to create and make and, and understand fully the ramifications of that. But so certified forest, for instance, is a conversation we have all the time and not always easy because it does add some money to our art costs. Yeah. How do you, I mean, when you think about it, business owners in general or entrepreneurs in general, we are so geared towards thinking profit is what oftentimes motivates us. How do we get people to think more in equal tiers of people and planet. They're not just thinking profit. I mean, how do you, any thoughts around how we bring, I mean, because people naturally gravitate towards profit. That's what, I mean, even major companies, you see them doing it that are supposedly eco-friendly companies. Yeah. You know, I'm not really sure I have a good answer for that. I think, I think the bottom line is it has to come from somewhere inside of each of us, Okay, but also it has to come from the top in the, the business. I'm sort of known for not being overpaid, for instance, you know, we're an open book company and uh, we share the profits, we share the budgets, we share how we did in each of our divisions and each of our groups. And it's pretty clear that, for instance, while I'm well paid, I'm not overpaid. And, you know, when we look at, for instance, uh, the, the CEO of Alaskan Airlines getting a $10 million bonus last year after, you know, living on the backs of taxpayers and his and his flight attendants through COVID, it just, I mean, frankly, it, it pisses me off. Yeah. And it should get everyone angry. And in fact, I'm fine with an owner making good money. You know, there are risks, there's exhaustion, there's weekend after weekend. I get that. I was there. And in fact, when I sold the company to my 
employees. We can talk about that in a minute. When I sold it to the company, I was well compensated, but I wasn't $10 million bonus on the backs of taxpayers and, and my coworkers. You know, that's just not okay. So where does that come from? It comes from the top. Honestly, it comes from the top. And so, and those people who don't care, maybe don't stay as long as people who do. I mean, I have coworkers who have been with me now for the longest is 36 years, but some 30 year, 30 year people and, and everybody every year, you know, can make a decision whether they stay or whether they go somewhere else. And like I said before, I mean, I think it's a good business decision, too, because people really want to be where they want to uh, agree or have aligned values. Right. Be part of something. I think that can be a good thing. But as far as as far as how it happens and why other businesses don't do it, greed. You know, yeah. partly uh, fear, partly lack of lack of understanding of the value of what doing right, you know, can do for your company. I don't know. I'm not really interested in getting up out of soapbox here, but I no, I get it. I do believe that, you know, business is a wonderful opportunity to make social and environmental change. And I think if everybody believed the way we do and companies like us do, then I think we wouldn't be in the pickle we are right now on all sorts of levels. Yeah. Yeah. I also think like to some degree as a society, we're desensitized to when like crazy things happen, like using the example of the $10 million uh, bonus or payment to the Alaskan CEO, airline CEO. I think we're kind of desensitized to it because even like in during COVID, when the PPP loans were coming out, there was some loopholes there that apparently, you know, startups that were being funded by very wealthy venture capitalists were able to entertain in those. And it seemed like just society was desensitized to it. There's like, ah, oh, well, we expect this to happen. So I wonder if part of that, it, and it starts from the top to your point, like I feel like the top should be saying, no, that's not what we're doing or something like that. And I mean, literally at the top of the political chain too. And I think we kind of become, I don't know, we just like accept it, I guess. Yeah. The PPP money is an interesting example of government doing what it should do. And most of that money was well spent. Yeah, there are some, Agree. There are some uh, large examples, but interestingly, I dug in pretty hard and, and uh, I haven't found that many relative to the good that it did. Like in our case, for instance, one of our divisions, Pioneer Millworks, was mostly selling to uh, commercial and retail establishments that went from from 100 miles an hour to zero overnight, you know, on March 20th, 2020. And without and we pivoted hard to a residential exterior uh, siding model that has now become our largest seller and our and our biggest profit center. And uh, we couldn't have actually done that. It took about eight months for us to do that full pivot. And uh, honestly, we couldn't have done that without the PPP money. I mean, we would, we would have survived somehow. Uh, we would have borrowed from other divisions and the bank. But, you know, that PPP money was really of value. Normally, though, uh, we are unfortunately desensitized. We're in a situation where the head of our potential government can call people names and, and Congress just gets nothing done. And there's a lot of shame and dif difficulty there. And Lord knows if I had some answers to that, I would snap my fingers and make them. <laughs> I 100% agree with you, though. The cost of maybe some bad players in the PPP space was by far way smaller than the overall good it did for so many businesses being able to continue, uh, keep their employees, yeah. maybe even be able to expand faster once we got out of COVID. There were just so many things. I mean, I see it firsthand within my own client base. It was such a saving grace. And, and the speed that we moved at being able to do that, considering it was our government, was pretty impressive too. It was incredible. You know, I gave a speech on uh, what it is to stay in business during a recession and I, I gave it in conjunction with a friend of mine who's maybe a little bit more financially conservative. And at the end, uh, somebody wrote a review. They said, uh, they said um, that fellow, the other fellow said, you know, turn everything to gold and bury it in your backyard. And Jonathan said, you know, live fast, die young and leave a good looking corpse. And what he <laughs> meant was, you know, you just got to keep pushing through the hard times. You just have to push harder than ever. And uh, out of that, re that particular recession, we came out stronger than ever because we didn't lay off people. We didn't cut back on. And, and we were ready when the economy bounced back. And that's because we believe in people. You know, I didn't want my job is to make sure that my coworkers have work and can feed their families. And their job is to 
do woodworking or whatever it is their job is. So yeah. I'm fascinated you keep referring to your team as being your coworkers. Now I know that's part of the ESOP and people now have ownership in your company, but isn't it still are you are you the primary owner or are you no longer the primary owner in either one of the No, I'm not the primary owner. The ESOP is the primary owner, which is interesting. But even even okay. actually when I was the primary owner, I called people my coworkers. Really? That's cool. You know, the reality is I couldn't have moved out to Oregon and started fresh, leaving 100 people behind me in New York if they didn't have an ownership mentality. And how do you develop an ownership mentality? All the stuff I've been talking about. But in the end, you know, recently, uh, six years ago, we started to develop uh, an uh, ownership, actual ownership. As my friend John says, you know, you can't take the concept of ownership to the grocery store. You actually, you know, being an owner is actually a good financial decision. And so we looked at all the different mechanisms and we we decided that an ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Plan, which is part of the ARISTA set of laws that occurred in the 1970s, when, as I like to say, Congress was doing what Congress should be doing, which is bipartisan legislation to help everybody. You know, that that ESOP uh, mechanism has allowed me to sell the company to the people who have made it happen, which are all of my coworkers or employees, you know, as as is more typical to use. But I'm an employee now as well. So everybody's a coworker. Now that it's important to understand that because we're hundred percent employee owned now through whatever mechanism you might use, whether it's a co-op or shared uh, uh, phantom stock or an ESOP like us, you know, there still has to be a line in the sand between management and ownership. So our management has never changed. We still are, you know, relatively flat, but nonetheless, you know, we're well managed. And it's not like suddenly 160 people get to decide what's going to happen next week over at the Jones site. You know, we still have management. Uh, uh, change there. But but the reality is now everyone can partake in the value and the improved value of the shares in the company. And when they retire or otherwise leave the company, they cash in those shares for the value of those shares as determined by a third-party valuation company. And that's what they suddenly get. So, it, so in many ways, in the very least, an ESOP is another a uh, retirement mechanism like our 401k, which we also have. You know, I've, I just read a study over the weekend that, uh, that uh, what is it, 70% of the people d- are going to retire without enough uh, retirement. It's crazy. And, you know, that's scary. And I don't want my coworkers to be that part of that 70%. So I'm pushing hard for uh, savings in 401k, but also now with this ESOP, it's another opportunity for our savings. Yeah, sounds really cool. Now that transparency of sharing your salary, no, no, and the finance. Sorry, let me be clear. We're an open book yeah. company. We draw the line at what individual people make. Okay, so that's an important, subtle, and important point for those people who are considering open book management. Yeah, you know, uh, we share profits, we share costs. I, I teach people the great game of business, as uh, Jack Stack uh, uh, coined it years ago. I teach people where the hard costs are, where the fixed overheads are, what we do with profit, which is not just, you know, what people think. There's a lot of things that have to come out of profit, like taxes, charities, uh, cash reserves, uh, capital investments, things like that, and return on investment to ownership, of course. A gain sharing is another one. So I teach all of that. uh, And we share the numbers that make up the the pictures, but we don't share what any individual actually got it. Got it. And that we just find that to be a professional courtesy. And plus, you know, out of context, suddenly everybody's pissed off. Yeah. Um, by the way, that's a book, the the Great Game of Business. Great book. If uh, I'll put that in the show notes. One thing I wanted to ask you, and I didn't finish the question. So that transparency. Let's okay. Scratch the part about showing a compensation, but the transparency of showing the numbers. Did you do that pre ESOP or was that just post ESOP and you started sharing all the numbers? <laughs> no, I've actually done that for twenty five years. You know, we have pictures oh, wow. of when we were just like twenty people in a rundown warehouse that we were renting for cheap of me sitting in front of a flip chart sharing with a bunch of, you know, I think I had really long hair at the time or certainly more hair and, uh, and 
<laughs> you know, I've been doing this for 25 years in an open book format. One of the things we do, which some of your uh, re, uh, uh, listeners might be interested in, is we shut down one day of the year for what we call our day of business. Everybody shuts down. The phones go on automatic answer. We spend the whole day together as a company. Uh, I and some of my other leaders, co-workers talk about budgets. We talk about projects that have been coming. We talk about, you know, actual a 10-year rolling financial performance. Uh, we share birthdays, celebrations. In the afternoon, then, we also will bring in some maybe some special speakers or breakout sessions. And then at night, we uh, bring in some food trucks, drink beer and throw axes. If you're a business owner feeling stuck in your business, overwhelmed, responsible for everything that happens and working long hours, Tyler helps his clients develop processes, hire high performing team members and better understand their financial metrics and numbers to allow for a more predictable, less hands on business. To schedule a free, no pressure consultation, head to thinktyler.com and click the meeting button. Tyler would love to see if he can help you work on your business, not in your business. Schedule a consultation today at thinktyler.com. Think life, think success, think business. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Toulousma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Toulousma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on Electricast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. We also will bring in some maybe some special speakers or breakout sessions. And then at night, we uh, bring in some food trucks, drink beer and throw axes. <laughs> I like to throw. I don't know how about drinking and axes, but I'm sure you guys figure it out. Nobody's been hurt so far. And don't <laughs> tell my insurance guy this. Absolutely. So the, my question is this. Pre-ESOP, you're sharing financial information. How do you manage like... Because a lot of times business owners say, oh, I don't want to share that. I mean, people get the wrong impression. We're making, it'll look like we're making too much money or, or we're not paying people enough. How did you manage that? Or did you ever have those issues? Or did you just set expectations? What do you do? Yeah. Well, also the other flip part of that, the flip side of your question is what happens when you're doing terribly? Won't people get uh, concerned and run away? True. That's a great one. I think you have to develop a culture of as much trust as you can. It's never perfect. and Honestly, I mean, if you think about it, if your numbers show you're, quote unquote, making too much money and not paying people enough, maybe you're not paying people enough. And it's tricky, of course. You know, we have a couple of we have some mechanisms where we are able to help out like on good years, our profit sharing is more than not so good years. You know, during the Great Recession from 2008 to 2012, I like to say uh, there was no profit sharing. On the other hand, we didn't cut back on, uh, we didn't lay people off and we didn't have cutbacks on salaries or benefits. So, you know, but there was no profit share. So, you know, normally when we have as good a year as we had a couple of years ago and last year, we have good profit share. So, you know, people, if, if in fact you're afraid to share your numbers, I suggest you look at why. And you have to be able to also tell the story. Like, what do those numbers really mean? There's reasons why profits exist. And I listed all of those, you know, on the net profit uh, list. All those things are important. Capital expenses. You know, we're, we're going through some major capital expenses this year, which will be good for everybody. But, that, but that's, you know, capital expense comes out of profit. And, and you, if you don't have profit, you can't invest in yourself, as an example. Uh, as well, we're also putting away money in some CDs to prepare for retirement of people. In an ESOP, you have to have money, you have to have cash available for when somebody retires to buy them out. If you don't have that cash available, it can ruin and crush a company. So right now we're working hard to put some of the profits that we're making now aside in you know, long-term CDs and the rest, which, which aren't a bad return on investment right now, you know, compared to a few years ago. Um, CDs, you can get four and a half, five percent and and it's solid and then tax deductible. So 
Yeah. So uh, now talking about the ESOP itself, it sounds like that's been a good decision for your company. Is, is that a pretty big undertaking going into the ESOP, having your employees buy into the company? What does that look like when you... Yeah, when, it's a big undertaking. Really? Yeah, let me be really clear. It's a big undertaking. It is not for every company. I think we're about, you know, we're about as small as 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 you want to get and still do it. And here's why. You do it in tranches, which is simply a French word for slices. So we did it 30% tranche and then 100% tranche uh, about five years later. And um, each tranche, you know, can easily cost you a quarter million dollars. And so that's not a small amount for many companies. And then on a yearly basis, management of that ESOP is probably forty or fifty thousand dollars a year. So you know, for many companies, it's just a lot of money. The flip side of that is it's a tax protected entity, so you're saving extraordinary amount of federal and uh, state income taxes because, or I'm um, excuse me, federal income taxes uh, because it is, I say, a tax protected entity. This tax protection allows you to uh, be bought out, you being the owner be bought out by the ESOP without putting a financial burden on the people who make up the ESOP. You know, so we we pay for our ESOP from tax savings and of course from earnings and some uh, borrowing with our bank. So I would say that there's a really, it's a great way to go if you're sort of big enough, I would say, to make it happen because the reporting and the costs thereof are high. You know, the DO, the DOL, the Department of Labor, looks at it really hard because they're the ones who monitor the ARISTA laws, which those are the laws that protect pensions and savings and 401ks and things like that against uh, untoward greedy people. But the IRS is also on you like a bee on honey because it's a tax protected entity. And therefore, anytime you get into tax savings, you also get into the opportunity for greed and fraud. So you're really monitored very, very closely. And I, for one, don't want to go to jail. So, you know, we we are by the books and it's not easy. The other interesting thing about um, an ESOP is you're pretty much required by your independent uh, trustee, which is somebody who's monitoring you and how you're doing, to create a serious board of directors. My guess is most of your listeners don't have what I would call a serious board of directors. Right. And and I never did. I mean, I never did. 35 years later, 160 people, never a real board of directors. And suddenly now I have an independent board of directors who I report to. It's a pretty fascinating, at times exhausting process. But I like to I, I, I think of it as sort of growing up a little bit. You know, suddenly I'm working at the pleasure of other people, at the pleasure of the board. And I have to report to that. and they hold my feet to the fire. And that's different than many of your people want. For me, it's been a good thing, but a little bit like going to the dentist, which is really a good thing. It's not always fun. So, you know, it's it's a whole different way to look at things going into something like an ESOP. There are other ways to share ownership if, if uh, your people are interested in that. But, you know, if you're going to be an ESOP, you need to be a sizable, I would I'm just going to guess 20 million and, and profitable plus. Sure. When when you say serious board, like, because, you know, a lot of small businesses, they'll have, you know, like kind of a friends and family type board. But when you say serious, like, how do you form that? Do you get help from these outside agencies that are overseeing or is that is that within your own? Yeah, yeah. So I did actually, <laughs> uh, I and some of my coworkers did recruit three independent board members from a list of available board members who are skilled and experienced in areas that we wanted. One of them was in the high performance construction industry. Another was coming from the finance CFO world, but finance and CFO world in an ESOP. And then the third had uh, built up and sold her own company and serves on two or three other ESOP boards. So they understood, or at least there was two of them who understood the world of ESOPs, which has been extraordinarily helpful because there's a lot to know. But but all of them are good people who are certainly certainly not going to listen to me. They're going to they, they want me to report and and as I said before, I hold my feet to the fire on all the things we report on four uh, four times a year and sometimes in between. But it, but they've been a great asset, honestly. Um, so we so I have a six person board, 
three internals and three externals. Now, not everybody believes in the internals because there are some conflicts of interest there. And, sure. um, you know, if, if it's a really hard conversation, do you really want so-and-so internal in that conversation? There are times when myself and the external uh, board members will retreat to an executive uh, uh, session. But for me, I've always been very inclusive. Um, I believe in, uh, in, in ownership in many ways and empowerment in many ways. So for me, it was never a question. I wanted some of my internal coworkers who I respect to be there to share in the thinking process, to help me understand the best decisions and the best directions. And that's been, for us, a really good approach. So three people internal, three people external. What have you seen post CSOP now within your own coworkers? Have you seen a change in behavior or a change of the way they approach their job or how they look at the company? Can you, is there a big impact? Yeah, Tyler, I've always said we've always had an ownership mentality. I mentioned that earlier. Yeah. And we've only now been 100% employee owned for a couple of years. I would say I don't really know. You know, verbally, uh, people are like into it and thankful. We are really developing an a employee communications committee that really is doing, I think, amazing work in training people on what it is to be in an ESOP and what our opportunities are. But I would lie if I said I had some sort of specific data on it. Um, and, you know, when you're 22, which we hire new people and have young people, they're pretty much not thinking about their retirement. Right. Much as I hammer them on the head, say you ought to be thinking about your retirement and try to teach what compound interest development is. You know, they're, they're still pretty loose and, and not as interested or not as turned on by it as maybe yeah. somebody who's 34 with two kids going, oh, wow, I actually am mortal and I do really need to you know, provide for my family. So, you know, we see a lot of differences in there and I, I, I don't have a perfect answer for you. Gotcha. Hey, I want to circle back to the triple bottom line. I know it's important to you and I think it's important to society. What are your thoughts around like, what, what should we as business owners, like what could you say to us that could help us really keep those three facets of the triple bottom line at the forefront of our minds when we're making business decisions, when we're thinking about the impact we're having on society as a whole? Well, from the traditional business owner thinking, this is kind of a radical thought, you know? Right. But I would emphasize that it actually is good business, plain old good business. And I've mentioned it before and I'll mention it again. You know, people want to work at places that they can believe in and they'll stay longer at places they can believe in. If your values are aligned with your coworkers, who we spend eight to 10 hours a day with, gosh, you know, then it's a better place to work. So I think that all three of them lean on each other. The truth is, I really can't tell your listeners uh, what it is to decide that the planet is worth saving. You know, if, if they don't know that, I can't help. Sorry. The people part's easier, makes sense, makes sense to care about those people who you can see and whose hands you shake every day. The profit is obvious. Planet. I don't know. You just got to believe that we can make a difference. Does cash flow have you down? Profit, not where you think it should be? Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you. And thanks for listening to the show. The profit is obvious. Plan it. I don't know. You just got to believe that we can make a difference. It's hard. I mean, it is because you hear so many things and you have to be the one to make that little incremental that you can't really see the difference, but it has an incremental improvement in what you're doing. That's at least what I believe because it's hard to see it. You can't really see an impact each individual can have. I'd say, two, don't lie about it. You know, I laugh and say, never lie to teenagers or coworkers. You know, they'll find you out for sure. So be consistent, actually care, walk rather than run. Boy, if we could all make that, those smaller steps often, then, you know, there's some sort of a chance, I think. Yeah, I like that. I'm a believer in technology. I think we're going to, 
you know, we're going to continue to do good things with technology, but uh, it's going to take more than just that. Right. No, that's good stuff. Okay. I appreciate that. Hey, your websites, and I'll put this in the thinktyler.com show notes, uh, newenergyworks.com and then pioneermillworks.com. Those are your two websites. If people wanted to reach out to you, either one of those websites or where should they go? Yeah. So New Energy Works is a design build firm. We specialize in high performance, energy efficient, and highly crafted timber works on on both coasts. So we work all over the country. Uh, And um, Pioneer Millworks makes wood things like flooring, paneling, and uh, siding out of uh, reclaimed and sustainably harvested wood. Both of those are available. If you want to reach out to me, I'm just Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, at either of those places. I am more than happy to have conversations after this with anybody who's interested. Awesome. I can't thank you enough for being part of the show. I love what you, well, I love ESOPs. I think they're a great thing for employees to have a piece of ownership. They really are. Definitely love you. You've taught me that term. I'd never heard of it before, a triple bottom line. I think that's a cool term. I got to go read more about it. So I think those are both awesome things you're doing. Thanks. Thanks again. Take care, Jonathan. Yeah, Bye. thanks for having me on. That's all for this episode of Think Business with Tyler. But we have plenty more resources to help you in your pursuit of business excellence on our website at thinktyler.com. If you'd like to be featured in a future episode of the show, feel free to reach out to us on social media at think underscore Tyler. We look forward to helping you think life, think success, and think business. 